Nick, one of the pushbacks I get from our audience is uh, against my claim that renewables, which is wind, solar, and batteries, are now the lowest cost for way to generate electricity. Would you agree that they're the lowest cost or would you disagree? I absolutely agree with that statement. There's various levels in which we can analyze the costs of renewables. So we can look at just the introduction of additional generation into a system, um, the cost comparative to either existing generation that's already on the system or other additional generation. So let's say you're in a situation where you have load growth, like the US is a prominent example at the time, um, and you need additional electricity generation capabilities. So then it's really prudent to compare solar, for example, against coal for new plants. Or if you have uh, an existing set of generators, this is also valid for uh, a new, numerous systems in the US, many states, where you have existing capacity for fossil generation that's already on the system and you want to replace or displace some of that generation. So the comparison changes depending on whether you say, what is the cheapest new source or what is the cheapest source to generate electricity? Now, the positive thing from a renewable side is that we've crossed the line on the cheapest, newest form of generation a while ago, a few years ago already. And in many parts of the world, including the US, but also all the way to countries where coal is relatively cheap in India, new solar electricity is cost comparative or cheaper than existing fossil generation, for example, from coal. And so now we've gone over both of those hurdles and it really makes the economic case much clearer. Yeah, there, there is, a, it's a asymmetrical, as, as economists used to say. What is true in China or India is not necessarily true in Canada, the United States, or, or Europe. There's just a lot of variation here. But is it fair to say that for the most part, in most regions of the world, renewables are now the lowest cost? Yeah, that's absolutely fair to say. And specifically, solar is the, the leading provider there for a majority of the globe. Um, if you just look at a map of the, if you would look at a map of the cheapest electricity source, uh, you would see about 90% of it uh, covered uh, with solar. And then you'd have a few holdouts where, for example, onshore wind is uh, the cheapest form of electricity generation in the UK, um, which obviously is a result of weather conditions, latitude, etc. So, there's a few countries where it might be um, where it might be wind uh, onshore wind generation, but gen or geothermal if you're going to Iceland for the very very few exceptions there. Uh, other than that, solar is already the the dominant source if you're looking for an affordable way to add more capacity to your system. How do you respond to the criticism that solar isn't uh, appropriate or applicable in some markets? And uh, that might be in countries uh, near the equator that have monsoons, a monsoon season. Uh, it might be, for instance, uh, I live on Vancouver Island off, off the west coast of Canada and our winters are rainy and gloomy. There's just not a lot of solar. Uh, in Alberta, the neighboring province, uh, you know, the, the sun is very weak in the wintertime. Might have a lot of sunlight, but there's just, it's not a great resource. Um, how do you respond to those kind of criticisms of renewables? Yeah, so it's 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 obviously not a single answer for every day and every hour of the, of the year. Um, but generally speaking, even in areas, let's say in, in the tropics where you might have uh, monsoon seasons, for example, in India, we see really strong solar generation all across the year. And the reason that around the equator solar generation is so dominant in terms of price competitiveness is because the capacity factor, so how much solar generation you get out of your capacity um, installed is excellent. So it's nearing or above 20%. Whereas countries that are further away from the equator obviously have a lower capacity factor. So that doesn't necessarily mean that solar isn't a useful or affordable source of electricity there. For example, in Germany, 
um, a country that, if you just look at the latitude, is very much on par, if not further north than a majority of the population in Canada, is making excellent use of its solar resources. And it sits in a region that actually gets a lot less sunshine than some of Canada's uh, some of Canada's region. Germany is a solar leader, and the country to its north um, west, the Netherlands is actually one of the global leaders in solar generation per capita. This is the number two behind um, Australia. So it's, I think it's, it's fair to say that, for, at least from an economic standpoint, latitude does play a role, but it really is only the countries that push even further. Maybe if you go then further to Norway, where it becomes um, more of a question between solar or wind as the cheapest source. I'm really glad you brought up the example of Germany because they, we have a Canadian company from Alberta, actually, uh, that is a leader in advanced geothermal, and this is Ever Technology, and it's completing its first commercial project just south of Munich, and the it's a closed loop geothermal. So it you know it's like it's like building big radiator underneath the ground to heat up the the fluid or the water that's in the in the pipes. And um, the idea, you know, the, I've interviewed Ever, and they think that the price is going to come down to around the fifty dollar a megawatt hour, which would make it pretty compatible. Uh, sorry, competitive uh, f with uh, you know base load power like um, coal and and gas. Here's my here's my question. It's it it is it appears that the all of these clean energy technologies are either. Uh, well-developed, mature, like solar and wind and batteries. In addition, there are new clean energy technologies like advanced geothermal that are coming along. And that it do, it's not necessary to be able to do 100% of power generation with renewables today. It's, it's important to get as much as you can. And then as the technology uh, changes over time and the costs change over time, you can then do the rest of the, the power grid, the power system. Is, is that a fair way to look at this? Yes. So one of the metrics that always gets, I would say, the brunt of the criticism is LCOS, so the levelized cost, uh, LCOE, sorry, a levelized cost of electricity. And that's essentially the cost of delivering power from any installation. And that includes the operating cost, but also includes the construction cost. So for solar, obviously, you have lots of upfront costs, and then you have essentially no marginal costs as it produces when the uh, sun is hitting the panel. And those essentially, apart from, from maintenance, you have no additional costs per kilowatt hour produced. And on the other side, you have coal, where the upfront costs are slightly lower when you're building a coal, coal plant, although they're still pretty substantial. And then you have marginal costs for every single kilowatt hour. Now, that metric is really, really useful when you have a system where you're adding different sources like we're doing now. Most systems globally are not just one source and are actually made up of a variety of sources, both from a renewables perspective, you have nuclear uh, and, and fossil fuels as well. And then those costs are actually quite comparable. Now, there's a new metric that has come around and is often mentioned, and it's the sort of the system cost version of this. Uh, and the system cost version has a fallacy that assumes what would it cost if the entire system had to be provided by that one source. And naturally, a dispatchable source like coal and gas doesn't change dramatically. There's some inefficiencies there, but the levelized cost of electricity to this like total system cost is very similar. But if you do that with solar, then suddenly your total system cost, if you only had solar today, would be relatively high. That is, I think, a completely flawed comparison. The fact is when we're installing solar panels in China, in the US, in Germany, we're not installing them in systems that are entirely made up of wind and solar power. And the fact is that your returns decrease pretty significantly as you near those 100%. So the first 80% are significantly easier where costs for, for wind, for solar power, are much, much lower, and the integration costs into the system as well. So over that period, you you can get to 80% at relatively low cost. The cost really only increases sharply once you get to 90%, 95 and then to 100 So those cost comparisons are really, have to be done really carefully. 
Uh, well, let's wrap up the interview with this question. And that is, uh, I'm hearing this from uh, uh, solar companies and wind companies in the United States in particular. And they're saying, look, it's not, it's no longer the cost of the equipment, the cost of the solar panel, the cost of the wind turbine, the cost of the controls, whatever. Those costs have come down to the point where uh, the, that, you know, renewable power gen is competitive with, with fossil fuels. It's the integration. It's the engineering. It's the permitting. It's the interconnection queue. It's all of these other uh, variables that are necessary to, uh, or as part of the process of bringing the renewables into the grid, that's where the higher costs are and jurisdictions are beginning to tackle those and bring those costs down. Is that something we're seeing across the globe? Absolutely. So as we've installed more solar power and really half of the growth in solar power has happened over the last three years. So it's we've seen a rapid scale up recently. As we've installed more, we're getting more and more hours where solar is reaching a higher and higher share. And with a higher share, you need more flexibility. You have other sources that aren't very flexible. For example, some coal plants need to run in a sort of base load configuration and can't really accommodate for other sources in the system and make life a bit harder. So you do need flexibility. Those costs weren't as important a few years ago as they are today. So they, they do matter. The good news is that we do have a technology that fits perfectly into that niche, and that's battery storage. And battery storage unlocks two really important things. A, it lets you integrate more renewables into your system. It gives you slack so you can store um, excess production during times where demand might not be as high as your generation, for example, from solar panels during the middle of the day, and then dispatch them at night when they're required and power prices are higher. But it also can provide other system services that can stabilize the system, can free, can keep frequency under control. And with newer versions of these, these battery systems can also perform the same functions that in the past fossil fuel generators have performed, like keeping the grid frequency. And there's a really important point here is that because the solar costs have fallen so much and battery costs have come down, uh, have nearly halved in the last two years, we're now at a point where solar and storage are cost competitive with fossil generators. And this is not just for countries um, that have really high fossil import costs, like in, in Europe, for example. This is also true for India, for example. And we've recently done a study on this that shows that solar with batteries are actually cost competitive with new coal plants as well. Uh, Nick, uh, fascinating insights. Thank you very much for this. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.